Next up, we have uh, Dr. Barbara Beacons. Uh, Dr. Beacons is a research hydrologist for the U.S. Geological Survey Water Mission Area located in Menlo Park, California. She has studied the fate and transport of crude oil contaminants in groundwater for over 25 years. She serves as research coordinator for the USGS Crude Oil Spill Study Site near Bemidji, Minnesota, for those Minnesotans that's up there in Lake Country, and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. As something fun, during COVID-19, she has been enjoying finding recipes for unfamiliar produce, such as fava beans, which are delivered weekly to her in a CSA farm box. So thank you so much, Dr. Beacons, for joining us today, and we look forward to your talk. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be able to present our results for a terrestrial spill. This uh, is a terrestrial oil spill site, and it's been studied by the USGS and uh, many academic partners that we've worked with over the years since 1983, so four years after it started. Uh, the site today, uh, management of research at the site has always been funded by the USGS, but in the last um, you know, eight years, it's also been partially funded by Enbridge Energy, who's the responsible party at the site. They uh, acquired the Lakehead pipeline system where the spill originally occurred in 1979. Uh, so the site has a rich data record and infrastructure to continue to, um, to aid our understanding of the long-term fate of oil in the environment. And this, uh, my title slide here is an overview of the spill at the time it occurred with all the areas impacted with, by the oil outlined in the, in the dashed yellow line. And a, and a full-size tanker truck is there as, uh, as a white square, so you get an idea of how much was impacted. Um, the, the break was here along the pipeline, and um, it was under pressure, so uh, the oil sprayed out over a large area, and then it also flowed along the ground. Okay, so you should be seeing my second slide soon. Um, so it was line three that broke and actually line three has been responsible for the two biggest uh, terrestrial oil spills in, US, in the US. Um, and line three is a line that Enbridge is trying to um, work with uh, Minnesota and the tribes of Minnesota to replace um, in the future. So as I said, it was a buried line uh, under 500 PSI pressure, 34 inches in diameter. So the spill was a little bit larger than uh, the one we just heard about in Alabama, 441,000 gallons. It was a light crude and the cause was a bad weld on the, on the pipeline. So line three has kind of been a bad actor for a while. There's just a schematic of the bad weld. So the site's located up here um, outside of the town of Bemidji near the source of the Mississippi River. But um, here's another uh, aerial photo of the site at the time of the spill. Uh, there used to be railroad tracks here. This was the pipeline right of way. You can see that uh, the trees are cleared for the pipelines. There were just three pipelines now. then. Now there's six. Um, so this was the area that was sprayed. So it was forested and the trees uh, were coated with oil. And then that sprayed area, the, the oil kind of flowed along low areas to a wetland. Okay, so my third slide, um, I'm showing you a series of photos illustrating the emergency response at the time of the spill. So the emergency response uh, it was estimated to have removed about 75% of the spilled oil. Most of that by pumping, 83% by pumping. Um, and then excavation and land farming. So they dug up a lot of contaminated soil that accounts for 6%. And then finally burning or evaporation. So you can see um, a picture here of uh, the burned oily uh, vegetation that was uh, used to remove about 10%. So the excavation, um, this site is a glacial outwash, 
uh, sand and gravel aquifer from the, uh, the big continental glaciation. So the oil soaked in within days into the aquifer and now it's at the water table. So here's a, um, a Google Earth image of the site today. Uh, it is managed for logging. It's on state forest land. Um, the pipeline right away runs through here. The site of the pipeline break is here in the yellow star. The blue areas show where the oil moved along uh, the surface. The yellow area is the spray zone. Um, and notice how lightly vegetated the spray zone is. I'll show you another picture of that. Uh, the three black outlines are where the oil is sitting at the water table and providing a continuous source of contamination to the groundwater, which my talk will mainly be focused on. The white spots are uh, mostly observation wells, and then we also have some locations along the shore of this down gradient lake. So groundwater flows um, along this uh, line of wells, kind of left to right, and uh, the plume, uh, this down gradient lake is about 300 meters from the center of this oil body. So the spray zone um, I mentioned is very lightly vegetated. And the reason why is because the soils are hydrophobic. So the spray zone was never contaminated uh, below the surface. Only the top meter was affected and no um, hydrocarbons and transformation products the hydrocarbons and transformation products are transported to the water table, but not the oil. Um, so this uh, is a close-up of how water beads up on the surface. Um, so this is the cycles of heating and cooling of the oil-coated sediments leads to this hydrophobic behavior. And here are some students uh, from a school in St. Paul. That you can see uh, them playing with the hydrophobic soils. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk on the groundwater contaminant plume since this is a talk about a seminar about water contamination. Um, so here's an overview of the aquifer with the lake and the green um, showing monitoring wells. Um, in 1996, this was the contour of the 10 microgram per liter benzene concentration in the well, in, as mentioned, measured in the groundwater on, with the wells. And then coming forward to 2010, you still see um, just 3.3 micrograms per liter of benzene, so below the MCL at about the same location in the aquifer. So the natural biodegradation is doing a good job of controlling the benzene plume at this site. Um, and the main control on the degradation, um, this is anaerobic because there's so much oil in the aquifer, but there's a large supply of iron oxide and iron oxyhydroxide coatings on the aquifer sediments that is coupled to anaerobic biodegradation at the site. So that was, this was the site where uh, anaerobic biodegradation coupled to iron reduction was first documented. So next I'm going to show you a cross section along this line. So uh, these are our wells um, and you can see there are a lot more upgradient. This was outlined in red as the 1996 um, contour of the benzene and what you can see is that um, so the benzene plume is still being controlled in this area. We don't have a lot of wells down gradient, although we've been adding them because uh, some parts of the plume are moving down gradient. And there was an attempt to pump more oil out of the aquifer between 1998 and 20, 2003, and the pumped water was infiltrated here and formed a secondary plume under the main plume. So um, most of the plume mass today is um, non-volatile dissolved organic carbon. Um, 
this shows uh, a, a line graph of uh, distance along the center line of the plume, concentration measured in the groundwater uh, for a non-volatile DOC, and also for benzene. So the benzene is way down here at about three milligrams per liter. In contrast, the DOC is almost 30, so an order of magnitude higher in 1995. And then by 2016, so um, about 20 years later, you're seeing um, that the plume has expanded by about 10 meters. So it's expanding about two meters a year. And the reason for the expansion is because there's a finite supply of iron oxide on the sediments, and that's consumed during the biodegradation reaction. So the plume, um, but the good news is, is there's a very robust decrease in concentration due to biodegradation where iron is present. Um, and, but the biodegradation doesn't go to completion of this DOC. This is the background DOC. And so you can see that um, some of the DOC is reaching this late down gradient. So I just want to, um, my talk is gonna be very focused on present day methods for characterizing these sites. So a lot of you are probably familiar with the total petroleum hydrocarbon measurement in the diesel range. So that's generally required at oil spill sites. Um, and it just is a liquid, liquid extraction from the water uh, with a GCFID um, analysis. And all compounds that elute between uh, and the normal and alkane C10 and the normal alkane C28 are counted regardless of whether they're hydrocarbons or not. Um, one problem with the liquid-liquid extraction is that much more uh, efficient extraction methods for water are used today for DOC. So here is a comparison uh, published by Phoebe Zito and colleagues. Phoebe's at the University of New Orleans. It's showing um, how much carbon is recovered with the liquid-liquid extraction in black and how much is covered with three different um, solid phase extraction methods, where the best one is the Oasis HLB extraction, which is gonna be used for uh, the rest of the results in the study. Um, and here's the background site for comparison. You have um, the same extraction ex efficiency across, these are different distances in the groundwater contaminant plume, 39, 102, and 254. So uh, because uh, researchers noticed um, in 2003 that more than just hydrocarbons were coming out and being quantified in a total petroleum hydrocarbon method, they proposed that uh, silica gel cleanup be used to remove natural organic matter and polar transformation products of the hydrocarbons. So this has been very controversial. Some local regulators have allowed it. Uh, at present, um, other state regulators are developing policies about whether transformation products should be uh, removed from a total petroleum hydrocarbon analysis. So this, um, this controversy has huge implications for those of us who are concerned about uh, water quality impacts of uh, oil spills. So what I'm showing here is again data from different wells at different distances from the spilled oil these are samples collected from the groundwater contaminant plume. The vertical axis is concentration. So the total DOC here goes between 22, dropping to about two and a half milligrams per liter down gradient. If you do a total petroleum hydrocarbon in the diesel range, you see less than a third of what the total that's there. 
And if silica gel cleanup is allowed to remove the polar compounds, you see only about 6% of what is there. And you get below detection for these last two wells in the plume. So our interest is in exploring what does that mean for the potential health impacts of um, evaluating uh, uh, this water for potential health impacts. So in 2018, we, uh, we went to the field, we sampled five wells, um, four in the plume and one upgradient well. So three of the, the first two wells were in the hydrocarbon plume. The last two wells were in the plume, but there were only metabolites. So silica gel cleanup detected no true hydrocarbons at these last two wells. So we performed uh, two types of screening. The first type was a bioeffect screening where human liver cells are used. So these are, um, uh, these human liver cells are transfected with uh, 40, uh, with 90, with 46 different uh, um, transcription factors of one type and 48 of a different type. So these are transcription factors that are known to be associated with toxic response. Uh, the wells are, um, the cells are exposed to the evaluated compound and the response of the cells is measured by the amount of transcripted DNA of uh, lengths that are dummy lengths that vary with the transcription factor. So the dummy lengths can be measured on by capillary gel erect electrophoresis and fluorescence to determine the degree of response of each transcription factor. So um, these are the first of the results from the site. We mainly got responses in two transcription factors. One was the aerohydrocarbon receptor. So the vertical axis on this plot is upregulation compared to just a solvent control. The horizontal axis is the concentration of non-volatile DOC in the plume. So these higher concentrations are from near the spill and the lower concentrations are from down gradient. So what you see, and we also got um, upregulation of the pregnant xenobiotic receptor. What is really important about this is that um, silica gel cleanup, so the true hydrocarbons in the plume, we got a response that's the same as what the background site showed. So 1x, no upregulation from the true hydrocarbons at any location in the plume and for either receptor. The uh, liquid liquid extracted uh, portion of the chemicals, we did see a response. So this is what would be extracted for a typical total petroleum hydrocarbon measurement. And finally, if we use the, uh, an extraction method, a solid phase that gets the most possible carbon, we see an even higher response of these transcription factors. So uh, you're completely missing the toxicity if silica gel cleanup is allowed. You're partly seeing it if you're extracting what's, avail what's seen in a total petroleum hydrocarbon method and you're seeing even more if you do a more efficient extraction. So the second method that we used was um, a chemically activated luciferous expression. So again, on this axis is the non-volatile DOC concentration. Um, and on this axis is the response of the luciferase in these um, human liver cells. So this is the background site. Um, this is one mil water equivalent at 10 to the zero. So the mass that's added is the same as the mass in one mil of the water. Um, so here at the background site, you see um, no response until you get to uh, 40 times 
the in situ concentration. And then you see responses in the groundwater plume with the highest response at the closest well to the oil, 68 meters down gradient from the source. And then uh, lower responses with distance, although still a high response at 254 meters. So these responses can be normalized to a known positive control, which is a beta naphtoflavone a PAH that's typically used to test that um, these AHR responses are occurring in the test sample. So um, here, are, here is the response normalized to um, the beta naphtoflavone with distance from the oil body. So uh, the calyx response is shown here in red. So you get the highest response closest to the oil with the response dropping with distance, but still a response that's equivalent to 100 nanograms per liter of the beta naphtoflavone control. So you're still seeing a response that's associated with 100 nanograms of uh, a PAH. And the response relates better to NDD, to the DOC than it does to the TPHD. So in conclusion, uh, the required analyses at hydrocarbon sites underestimates the polar transformation products that are present. The plume is mostly polar transformation products at this point in time. The polar transformation product plume is expanding because the iron is being used up on the aquifer sediments. And in vitro cell assays show that the transformation products should be assessed further for toxicity. And my last slide, um, I'm just showing an illustration of our future plans we're planning to do in vivo response of a um, of fish embryo. Uh, this shows zebrafish will likely use fathead minnow embryos, uh, would be the next step for our research on these compounds in the plume. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be available for questions on the panel.